In this Photoshop effects tutorial, we'll learn on how to add excitement to a photo and bring more focus and attention to our main subject by creating the illusion of a smaller, cropped version of the image within itself. Itself, we'll be using a vector shape to create the dimensions of the smaller photo. So we can easily rotate and resize it without any loss of quality by adding a couple of layer styles to it, creating a clipping mask, sampling colors from the original photo, using adjustment layers, and adding a fun radial blur filter. This is the original image I'll be using for this tutorial. And here is the final image after working throughout all the steps. Any recent version of Photoshop will work just fine for this effect. I'll be using Photoshop CS6. After opening the image in Photoshop, duplicate the background layer by hitting Ctrl and J in Windows or Command and J in Macintosh and rename it as smaller version by double clicking on the layer itself. The next thing we need to do is create a new layer below the smaller version layer, so it ends up between the two layers we currently have. What most people would do here is click on the background layer to select it and then create a new layer, since by default, Photoshop always creates your new layer directly above the layer currently selected in the layers palette. Here's a trick that I prefer to use instead, and if you don't know about it, once you do know it, you'll use it a lot. Rather than creating a new layer above the currently selected layer, you can instruct Photoshop to create it below the currently selected layer by holding down the Ctrl key in Windows or Command key Macintosh while you click the new layer icon at the bottom of the layers palette. And now, Photoshop has created a new blank layer directly below the smaller version layer. Since I renamed the previous layer 1 to smaller version, Photoshop has gone and named this second new layer layer 1 in its place. I'm going to double click the layer's name and rename it as Clipping Mask, since in a moment, we're going to be using this layer to clip the layer above it. With the Clipping Mask layer selected in the layer's palette, Select the rectangle tool either from Photoshop's tools palette or by pressing U on your keyboard. Ensure that the shape fill color in the options bar is set to some solid color and the stroke to none. The rectangle tool draws rectangular vector based shapes, and with it selected, I'm going to drag out the approximate shape of my smaller, cropped photo. I want to bring focus and attention to the main subject of the photo, so I'll drag out a rectangular shape around the girl. With the vector shape drawn, notice what's happened in the layers palette. The clipping mask layer, which was a normal, blank layer a moment ago, has now become a vector shape layer. Now that we have the shape of our smaller, cropped version of the photo drawn out, we can use this shape as a clipping mask, which will clip the layer above it to the dimensions of the shape. To do that, hold down the Alt key in Windows or Option key in Macintosh and move your mouse cursor directly between the smaller version and clipping mask layers until you see your cursor change into the clipping mask icon. Once your clipping mask icon appears, simply click with your mouse to create the clipping mask. It won't seem like anything has happened yet in your image, but in the layers palette, the smaller version layer will indent to the right, indicating that it's now being clipped by the vector shape below it. Nothing much has happened yet to the image, but we're about to change that. We're going to create the appearance of our smaller, cropped photo around the subject by adding a couple of layer styles to the vector shape. Make sure the clipping mask layer is still selected in the layers palette. Selected layers are highlighted in blue. Then click on the layer styles icon at the bottom of the palette and select stroke from the list of layer styles that appears. This brings up the rather massive layer style dialog box set to the stroke options in the middle column. There are three options we have to change here. I set my stroke size to 20 pixels to create a standard photo border around my smaller photo. Depending on the size of the photo you're working with, you may find that a different value works better. 
Below that, make sure position is set to inside. This means our stroke will appear inside the boundaries of the shape. By default, position is set to outside, which causes the corners of the stroke to appear rounded. We want our corners nice and sharp, and inside does that for us. Finally, by default, Photoshop sets the stroke color to black in CS6 or some other color in the previous versions, which makes absolutely no sense, and obviously we don't want a black border around our image, so change the stroke color to white by clicking on the color swatch and selecting white from Photoshop's color picker. Here's what my image looks like so far with the 20 pixels white stroke applied. And with the layer style dialog box still open, click on the drop shadow style from the list. Make sure you click directly on the words drop shadow and don't simply click inside the checkbox to the left of it. We want to bring up the options for the drop shadow effect, and you need to click directly on the words themselves for that. This changes the options in the middle column of the Delayer Style dialog box from the Stroke options to the Drop Shadow options. Leave the opacity of the Drop Shadow to around 75% so it doesn't appear so dark, then change the angle of the shadow to 130 degree. Finally, set the distance to around 10 pixels, although you may need to increase this amount if you're using a larger image than the one I'm using and close the window by clicking OK when done. This is my image now with both the white stroke and the drop shadow applied. If you need to rotate, resize or reposition your vector shape at this point, make sure the shape layer is selected in the layers palette. Then use the keyboard shortcut Ctrl plus T in Windows or Command plus T in Mac to bring up Photoshop's free transform box and handles around the smaller photo. To move the shape, click anywhere inside the free transform box and drag the shape to a new location, or use the arrow keys on your keyboard to nudge it. To resize the shape, click and drag any of the free transform handles. To simply make the shape larger or smaller while keeping the same proportions for width and height, hold down the shift key as you drag any of the corner handles. Holding down Alt key in Windows or Option key in Macintosh as you drag will cause the shape to resize from the center rather than from the side or corner opposite from where you're dragging. Finally, to rotate a shape, click and drag your mouse anywhere outside of the free transform box. Press Enter or Return when you're done to accept the transformation. Rotating the shape adds a bit more excitement to the image. I've also made slight changes to the size and position of my shape. And with that, our smaller cropped photo around the subject is now complete. We're almost done. All of the work on creating the illusion of the smaller, cropped photo inside the main image is complete, and all that's left to do now is some work on the original image in the background. There's all sorts of things you could do with it. You could technically leave it alone and be happy with what you have at this point, but now that we've increased the focus on the main subject, the idea is to lessen the focus on the rest of the image that's in the background. You could desaturate it and make it black and white. Or, you could add a simple Gaussian blur filter to blur out the background. Or, you could use levels or curves to lighten the background and give it a washed out appearance. There's plenty of options, and you certainly don't have to do what I'm about to do here, which is to colorize it and add a radial blur effect, but if you do want the same look for your background, here's how you do it. Select the eyedropper tool from the tools palette or press I on your keyboard to select it. I'm going to use the eyedropper to sample a color from inside the smaller photo area and then use that color to colorize the original image in the background to make a little difference between the foreground and the background images. With the eyedropper selected, I'm going to click somewhere on the image to sample a color. Notice that my foreground color in the tools palette has now changed to that blue color I just sampled. 
I can now use this color to colorize the original photo in the background, using a hue saturation adjustment layer. Make the background layer in the layers palette to select it. Then click on the new adjustment layer icon at the bottom of the palette and select hue, saturation from the list. This brings up the hue, saturation dialog box, which I'm going to use to colorize my background. No need to start dragging sliders around to select a color here. I've already sampled my color from the image, so all I need to do is click the colorize option in the dialog box. Photoshop uses the sampled color to colorize my original image in the background. Before we go applying our edial blur, let's duplicate the background layer one more time so that we have a separate layer on which to apply the filter, since we never want to touch the original pixel information of our image on the background layer. Select the background layer in the layers palette, then press Ctrl plus J on Windows or Command plus J on Macintosh to duplicate it. Double click on the new layer's name and rename it radial blur. With the new radial blur layer selected in the layers palette, go up to the filter menu at the top of the screen, select blur, and then select radial blur, which brings up the radial blur dialog box. First, set the blur method to zoom, then set the quality to best. The amount option at the top determines how much of a blur effect you'll get. I'll leave the amount to the default value set to 10, but you may have to use a different value. The blur center option in the bottom right of the dialog box determines where the blur will originate from in your image. Try to position the blur center close to where the subject in your photo is by clicking at that approximate location in the blur center box. It's not the most accurate thing and it may take you a couple of tries before you get it right, so don't be afraid to undo the filter with Ctrl plus Z in Windows or Command plus Z in Mac and try again if at first you don't succeed. Click OK when you're done to exit out of the dialog box and apply the radial blur to the image. This last step is optional, but I think my radial blur is too intense. I want it to blend in more with the original image on the background layer, and I can do that simply by going up to the opacity option at the top of the layers palette and lowering the opacity to around 50%, which I think works nicely. Here, after lowering the opacity of my radial blur layer, is my final photo within a photo result. And for comparison, Here's my original image once again. Thanks for watching. I hope this tutorial helps you lot. Please like and subscribe.